Coming up next on Forbes.com Video Network, part two of our interview with Moonwalker Buzz Aldrin. Magnificent flight out here. Magnificent ventilation. We are moments away from three-time bronze medalist Hans Wegebauer's historic jump over Copper Gore. 2004. Let me check this dude out. Where'd he go? He was there and then, poof. Life comes at you fast. When it does, nobody covers your boat like Nationwide. Investments, retirement, insurance. Nationwide is on your side. Welcome back. I'm Forbes adventurer Jim Clash. Now that we've heard Buzz Aldrin walk us through walking on the moon almost four decades ago, let's get his insights on the future. Let's go on a little a lighter topic on the moon. Okay. I recently saw that... that when you guys were on the moon, somehow a switch got broken off, and oh. you used some sort of a, a device, a pen perhaps, to, to fix this. Yeah. Tell us about that. We uh, did our lunar surface activity, right. so I uh, quickly picked out the choice spot to go to sleep, which was on the floor. Th there weren't any chairs in the lunar module, yeah, sure. so I decided I'd sleep on the floor, and, and as I began looking around and some of the dust, lunar dust that was there, I, I saw what clearly was a broken off end of a circuit breaker. Where did it come from? So I looked up on the, on the panel on my side and uh, the broken one was the engine right arm on circuit breaker, which has it's to be to in to, take to get, off. well, to land too, to, for the main propulsion system. Um, so that's, that's maybe serious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I decided to use something that was uh, non-metallic, non-conducting. Right. Uh, and, and yet small, there were uh, ballpoint pens and there were felt tip pens, and I felt the felt tip pen that uh, showed up quite well because it, it flowed a lot of ink mm -hmm. uh, was a better non-conducting thing, just a safety choice. So I pushed it in and it stayed in. And uh, so now in my collection of memorabilia, I have a circuit breaker and I have a, a, a pen that was used. Uh, and uh, stayed in, and of course we didn't think about it anymore. You know, you mentioned that there was dust in the spacecraft, lunar dust. Mm -hmm. Did it have any particular smell? Was there anything about it that was different from sand on Earth? Yes. What did it smell We like? agreed that it smelled sort of like uh, burnt charcoal or the dust of a fireplace, ashes, uh -huh. that had some water sprinkled on it. And that generally has a characteristic uh, pungent mm -hmm. odor. So definitely was there was a smell to it. Yeah. yeah, and not too many people get to smell that because it's always in a uh, very Columbia, sealed Columbia, container uh, with very over. particular control <laughs> of the, the, the gases that are uh, allowed to yeah, contract I know, I know, lunar I know. rocks. Do you Certainly. have a space rock? We've been waiting for a long, long time. You don't have a moon rock? No. The moon rocks that we picked up let me remind you, were considered potentially toxic. Right, well, back then. Right, that's why the, uh, three crews that landed on the moon, Apollo 11, but, uh, Apollo 12, yeah, and Apollo 14, uh, Apollo 13 didn't land, right. uh, were all in quarantine and when they came back to see if any uh, uh, adverse effects uh, showed up in us guinea pigs. So, well, that, but that makes sense then, but now okay, we know so, it's not. So, it, I mean, it was not even a temptation. These were the, the, the property of all mankind by the Outer Space Treaty. Sure. Um, and they certainly were not the, our property. We're not supposed to do it. And if they were toxic, that was in violation of, of those rules. So nobody stuck a rock in their pocket. I can guarantee you that. I, I hope. What about when you actually stepped on the moon? Was, was there anything special there in your mind or was that just, okay, you know, we're here and this is just part of the formality? What I saw with the black sky and no stars in the horizon clearly curving away and, uh, and the, the great distinctness of a boulder on the horizon. I mean, you could tell that there was not going to be too many fans for the Flat Moon Society, okay? <laughs> but, but it just, absolutely nothing uh, of a sign of life. Now, we heard things in the headset, but we knew there was a vacuum, and there was just 
the, the stillness that you could never create on Earth. We didn't want to take helmets off to test it. Of course you could. But we knew there was no noise. But your, your first words on the moon, they were yours, weren't they? They were prompted by uh, a, an observation of looking around and just responding. And, and all I could come up with at that time was what I usually do, and which is maybe a cute contrast. So I said, magnificent desolation. I mean, those are two opposing words in a way, but the magnificence of the achievement of human beings after all these millions of years being able to use their brains to put together the material to, to make a spacecraft to go and visit another object and then to successfully land. Yeah. What a magnificent achievement. Right. But I was impressed with the total desolation of what I saw in front of me, the moon. People ask me where should an outpost to ensure the survival of the human race be? And I say, let's put the information Let's put the encyclopedias of all of our knowledge in a safe place on the moon. We can update it and change it and do that easily. But to establish permanent people there, 14 hours of daylight, gets hot as could be, 14 hours of darkness, no atmosphere, no protection against the radiation. Mars is clearly a better place. Mm. And we need to commit ourselves to permanence before we start spending a lot of money about sending humans there. But it is the ideal place. Buzz, thanks for coming Thank on. You. <laughs> Magnificent Desolation. Again, living legend Buzz Aldrin. I'm Jim Clash. To read my adventurer columns, go to Forbes.com slash adventurer or pick up a copy of Forbes magazine. And thanks for watching Forbes.com Video Network. <laughs>